The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephephtha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond all measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So before uh, we start today, I wonder, I know that all of you love um, these beautiful stained glass windows, right? And that our, our patron is the one on the left there, St. Luke. And you can see that Luke has some symbols, one above his head and then one down below, right? And so the one, the sort of cross with the, uh, I think it's a lantern and some wings, you might recognize that as the symbol for physicians, right? Medicine. And then below, he has um, a palette with a paintbrush. So one of the legends of Luke is that he was the first writer of an icon. So that's why he has the palette and the paintbrush. But then we also know that Luke was supposed to be or is purportedly a physician. And so um, when I hear these healing stories, whether in Mark, like they are today, or in any of the other three Gospels, for that matter, it always seems to draw me in. For caring and aiding those with ailments is as cross-cultural as it is ancient, going all the way back, even before Jesus. Treatment, then, has kind of changed over the years, as we know, uh, but you can be sure that book line library shelves chronicling the fascinating history of medicine and we have learned much since the days of Galen and I, I'm, I can always almost pronounce this name but we'll get there Hippocrates right the Hippocratic Oath first do no harm right but still there are times even now 
despite the advances in medicine when there is nothing left to do but invoke the name of Jesus, whether that is in the operating room, in the surgical waiting room, or at the bedsides of patients, the bedside of a loved one, hoping, that is, for a single word. And I must say that in the time that's been given to me, I've become far more connected to folks who have invoked that name, who have pleaded with all that they have, with the utmost sincerity for a cure, and heard nothing in return. I've been connected to them more than I have with folks whose ears have been opened or whose tongues have been touched by Jesus. Now, my friends, I do not discount miracles. There are some in this room. But I don't know many physicians who with a word could banish cancer or who with their own saliva could cure blindness either. Something deep down tells me that I shouldn't need to, but I still do. And because of that, I continue to wrestle with the agency of God and the suffering of ill children, cancer patients, arthritic joints, Parkinson's disease, and COVID-19. And thus the perennial question resurfaces, if God is all-knowing, all-powerful, why on earth is there suffering? Or more to the point, if God is in control, omnipotent, why is this happening to me? My wife, why is this happening to my husband, my child, or my friend? How personal does it have to get? before something changes. My friends, let me assure you that books do line the shelves of libraries chronicling the nature and trajectory of that theological question. Much as they do with humanity's attempt to alleviate suffering through the healing arts. And like you, no matter what folks say, I've witnessed the marvels of medicine at work, the truth that sometimes life is better through chemistry, right? I've heard the gospels at length and even witnessed a miracle or two, despite the fact that what was witnessed may have been deemed metaphysical or physiological, depending on who I told. And so we are left to hold things in tension in this life. And therefore, when I read or hear these stories in the gospel, I don't necessarily focus on the method of healing as much anymore as I do that the people that Jesus encountered, the deaf, the blind, the mute, those on the fringe, the foreigner, and think to myself, who are these people to me? It strikes me that I've known someone who has had to live under or with each of these conditions. But it was in the healing of someone who couldn't speak that brought a friend of mine to mind. And with that memory, the truth that there is at least one who has known life without words. And the very real prospect that she will pass away before hearing her daughter speak. And while this end remains plausible, she will be the first to tell you that all things are possible. And that while her daughter is yet to speak, it does not mean that they haven't learned how to communicate. Love finds a way. And if you hold on to anything, 
hold on to that. Hope is buoyant, though sometimes the truth of the matter has the ability to sink us like a stone. The fact is that sometimes these feelings of hope and loss, well, they oscillate back and forth, and they do so at will, on a whim, and persist even when checked. They're always there. For instance, I know that my friend, even though she'll be the first to tell you that all things are possible, has spent nights awake pleading with God, thinking and trying to discern what life will be like for her daughter after she is gone, how she might prepare for it even though she will not be there. What difficulties will await her when her mom is no longer there present to advocate for her? What if she still cannot talk by then? Will she ever find love? Who will care for her? Will she suffer at the hands of a public that does not understand, who might look at her as someone easy to forget or worse, expendable? I know there are nights when she has wished that the Lord would save her and that he would loose her tongue with a word like he once did and make her whole. And yet, she believes even though no word has ever been spoken. And if that is not faith, I don't know what is. Nowadays, I catch pictures of her on walks with her daughter on Facebook seeing smiles on their faces that no words can describe. I guess that's the work. And for the briefest of moments, I think of the peace that passes all understanding. But what else could it be if not love in the face of nonverbal autism? And what I find myself praying for in those moments is for more of that openness, for more of that in our own lives. Without saying a word, openness in the face of suffering, and for a moment, peace. And for the increase of faith that such moments so easily quickens in us, and the fact that what is loosed Sometimes, what is let go of, and moments when there is nothing but paralyzing fear, is in fact fear itself. And that the last word that will remain is mercy. Mercy.